Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-khalqi ajma'in. Sayyidina wa habibi qulubina abil qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Wa ala ahli baytih al-tayibin al-tahirin al-ma'asumin. قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما عندكم ينفد وما عند الله باق ولنجزين الذين صبروا أجرهم بأحسن ما كانوا يعملون من عمل صالحا من ذكر أو أنثى وهو مؤمن فلنحيينه حياة طيبة ولنجزينهم أجرهم بأحسن ما كانوا يعملون. God states in the Holy Quran that which is with you comes to an end, but that which is with God subsists. And surely we shall render unto those who are patient their reward. For the best of that which they used to do. Whosoever works righteousness, whether male or female, and is a believer, we shall give them new life, a good life, and we shall surely render unto them that reward, their reward in accordance with the best of that which they used to do. Amanna billah, sadaqallahu al-aliyyu al-azim. Allahumma salli ala. The third, fourth, and fifth of the holy month of Sha'ban, respectively, they mark the anniversaries of our third Imam, Al Imam Al Hussein ibn Ali, his half brother Abu Al Fadl Al Abbas ibn Ali, and the fourth Imam, Al Imam Ali ibn Al Hussein Zain Al Abidin alayhim as salam. The historical records tell us that Imam Hussein was born in the third year after Hijrah. And Al Abbas was born in the year 26 after Hijrah. And Al Imam Al Sajjad السلام, was born in the year 38 after Hijrah. And it's no coincidence, dear brothers and sisters, that these three luminaries who together along with Lady Zainab السلام, along with the rest of the women and children and the family members of the Prophet and the companions of Imam Hussein together they make the heroes they are the heroes of the Karbala episode it's no coincidence that we celebrate them together When we take them together, these luminaries paint for us a multi-dimensional picture of the great lessons of Karbala and its objectives. We know that Karbala and its objectives, the lessons that we extract from this moment in time, they were not just local and immediate. Yes, they had a profound effect in the place and time in which they occurred. Yet we know that those lessons and those objectives are timeless and universal. They are applicable for all times and all places. And this is why we say, كُلُّ يَوْمٍ عَشُورَا وَكُلُّ أَرْضٍ كَرْبَلًا The lessons that we take from this episode are timeless, they are universal in their application. Through Imam Hussein alayhi salam, we are reminded of the lesson, the great lesson of commitment to justice. Being committed to justice. We are reminded of the lesson 
of constantly pursuing the truth. We are reminded of the great lesson of the constant struggle for self-reformation and reformation of society. These are timeless lessons that Imam Hussein gives for us. We take from his life and legacy. We take these lessons and many other lessons. Through Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam, we are given one of the greatest expressions of loyalty, what it means to be loyal, to be genuine, to have true loyalty. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas gives us the example of what it means to express brotherhood and fellowship. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas gives us the example of what it means to express the highest state of sacrifice and giving through Imam Zain al Abidin, Ali ibn al Hussein, alayhi salam. We are reminded of the important lessons of faith, having true faith, having strength in faith and dependence on God, on expressing patience, absolute patience, and perseverance in the face of trials and difficulties and in the face of all odds. These are some of the lessons that we extract from these individuals, from their lives, from their legacies, especially as they relate to their commitment to the Karbala episode, their participation in that momentous event. Taken together, these luminaries, these three great individuals, they teach us the great lesson of what it means to be a wholesome human being, a complete human being, and a complete and wholesome servant of God. When we take them together, we see that each one of them gives us an important aspect of this larger whole, of what it means to be a complete and wholesome human being. Now, like I said, these individuals, their lives and their legacies and the lessons that we draw, they were not just immediate and local 1400 years ago in, in that specific place but they are timeless, they are universal. And so when we come, we for fast forward back to today, our day and age, the time and the place that we live in, and we think about what is it that we can glean, what is it that we can extract from this historical moment, from these historical personalities, what is it? What is the lesson that we can take from them taken together when we look at them as a whole, as a package, if you will? What is it that we can learn? How are their lives and legacies applicable to us today? When we look at the state of our world today, our lives today, we find that one of the most pressing issues, one of the most pressing challenges that we have is the existence of various forms of conflict. Conflict is apparent it is pervasive in our societies, in our communities, in the world today on both a small and a large scale. If we come down to the small scale, we find that as individuals, oftentimes, we are in conflict with one another. There are rivalries that come up between individuals. Sometimes these individuals are family members, they're blood relatives, they could be you know, siblings, they could be cousins, they could be spouses, they could be parent and child, they could be neighbors, right? They could extend to community, they could be strangers. Look at the conflict that occurs in, you know, social media today, right? Social media is its own world. And oftentimes, more often than not, we find that people engage in conflict, there's constantly conflict between people, right? We find that there is conflict, if we go broader, larger than the individual level, between groups, 
between certain political groups, between certain religious groups, between you know, ethnicities and, and people belonging to different nations and, and so on and so forth. That there is conflict, there is opposition. And of course, as we go higher and higher, we find that the conflict continues to be pervasive in the world that we inhabit today. And I think, brothers and sisters, one of the reasons, there could be many reasons why there's conflict in the world, whether it's on a small scale or a large scale. I'm not an expert in conflict. But I think that one issue, one reason why there may be conflict in the world is because it seems that we live in a world where expectations are there for uniformity. People expect sameness. They expect that everyone acts in the same way. Everyone looks the same way. Everyone does the same thing. There is this general expectation. It's lurking beneath. Some people, they express this expectation, right? They say it's only us, my skin color, no one else. Others, they may not express it, but we find that it lurks beneath in our communities, sometimes in our conscious. And we have this sort of expectation that there has to be uniformity. Everything has to be the same way. Everyone has to do things in the same manner. We typically take a one-size-fits-all approach to things. And oftentimes we find ourselves thinking in binary terms, black and white. Right? You're either with us or you're against us. If you do not support my cause, my political cause, my religious cause, my national cause, whatever it may be, if you don't support me, then that automatically means what? You're against me. We're either friends or we're, we're enemies. We either are allies or we engage in conflict. We are in opposition to one another because of this binary thinking. It's either this way or that way. There's no nuance. There's no middle ground. There's no quote-unquote gray area. It's either black or white. And we find that this kind of mentality, this kind of thinking is pervasive in the world that we live in today. But if we go back, we go back to the example, those who we've come to celebrate tonight, these individuals, we find three individuals, Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, alayhi salam, and Imam al-Sajjad, alayhi salam. These three individuals who they participated in the same event leading up to the Karbala episode, in it itself and afterwards, that the circumstances surrounding that event, the Karbala event, they all participated, these three individuals participated in the same event, yet when we look at their roles, we find that each of them was doing something different. They were participating in the same event, but they were each doing something different. They were not doing exactly the same thing. Life, brothers and sisters, requires nuance. We do not proceed in life based on binary terms, either this or that, either black or white, either for or against. Life requires nuance. Sometimes our life, it requires that we engage in immediate action, immediately, right away. Sometimes it requires patience. And this is what we learn in the case of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein engaged in action immediately. There was something pressing that he saw that needed to be done immediately. It could not wait. It could not be postponed. And thus, he engaged in immediate activity. Whereas, for instance, his son, Imam Zainul Abidin, or his brother, if we take the case of Imam al-Hassan, there was a postponement. There was a matter of patience, not immediate activity. They're in the same cause, the same event, yet they take two different approaches. Some of the things that we experience in life, they may require immediate action, immediate attention. 
Some of them might require delay. One person might immediately act, they might, the other person might find. They have the same objective, but that they will delay action. Yet we find oftentimes, this is not something that is acceptable to most people. Right, if there's an issue, an injustice in the world, as an example, I mean we can think of many different examples, but if we look at the various injustices that occur in the world, we find that oftentimes there's a lot of hype. We want immediate action. We want people to call out, to speak out immediately. And if someone decides that they're going to wait, they want to figure out what's going on. They want to think about maybe a more prudent way of you know, going about the business. We find many times that this person will get shut down. Why aren't you speaking? Why aren't you saying anything? Why aren't you doing anything? There's no nuance. You're either, you either do this immediately or you're not doing anything at all. Whereas what we find in these luminaries that they adopted different methodologies. They did things differently. Sometimes we find in our lives that circumstances require that we sacrifice everything that we have everything that we have and sometimes they require that we preserve, we maintain what we have for a greater good. And once again, look at the examples of the third Imam and the fourth Imam. Look at the example of Imam Hussein alayhi salam who gave everything that he had, all of what he had in sacrifice. He sacrificed everything that he had immediately. Whereas the example of Imam Zain al-Abideen tells us what? That he preserved his life. Yes, Imam Zain al-Abideen was ill, he was sick, but the tradition tells us that even in that state he got up, he picked up his sword, he was ready to go into battle. As Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, according to the historical records, she reminds him, she tells him, you're not in no state to fight right now. Otherwise, was it that Imam Zain al-Abidin didn't know how to fight? This is the grandson of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Was it that he was not ready to sacrifice his life? That he had a doubt? Absolutely not. Yet he realized that in the preservation of his life, at that moment, there was a greater good. There was a greater need for him to preserve. As Sayyidah Zainab, she herself could not go out and and fight in, in battle, the historical records tell us that several women, they died, they were participated in the battle and they died, and they did not belong to the Ahlul Bayt. They were wives and family members of some of the companions. Yet she realized that there is a greater good in maintaining her life at that time, in that moment, for a greater good. Otherwise the objective was the same, it's not a different objective. Sometimes we find in life that the circumstances, they require us to express strength through action. Through action, right? We find in the case of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, right? Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was a person of action. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was not someone that was okay with sitting back and letting things get done by others. He was a man of action. He expressed his strength through action and this is why he was ready immediately to act. Immediately to act. There was a condition that required immediate attention and action and so Abul Fadl Abbas went and he engaged in action. He went in order to provide the water for those who were in need. This required action. Sometimes our strength is not necessarily expressed in action, but it needs to be expressed in words. And this is the example that we see in Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. Imam Zain al-Abideen stood up in the court of the tyrant, the dictator, and he spoke eloquently, he showed his strength through his words, not necessarily through action, through fighting. And sometimes it requires 
not that we show through action or through words, but sometimes our strength is shown through a silent prayer, through sitting down and weeping, strength is shown. And again, we come to the example of Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam. Imam Zain al Abidin shows us what it means to worship God. He dedicated his entire life to showing us the best ways of worship. And we recite his munajat, his sahifa sajjadiya is a document that we are all aware of. We recognize, we recite. We recite the du'as that are mentioned in there, the munajat. The munajat is what? The munajat is a genre of du'as which is translated as the silent prayers. Sometimes you have to stand up and yell. You have to call out loudly, profoundly, and sometimes you express that strength through silent prayers, through whispers. Depending on the context, the objective is the same. Yet the ways that we go about may require different ways of behavior, different methods of behavior. If we reflect on the famous hadith by the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin The hadith that we know and we have memorized he says إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Indeed actions they are judged by what? By their intentions إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ The standard for judging an act is the intention behind the act the intention is the engine that drives the action, right? If we reflect on this, the way that I take this, I personally interpret this hadith, I understand this hadith is in this way. That the core is one. There is a unique core, one core. And as long as that core is maintained, then the ways of approaching that core may be different. If that core is a good core, if the intention is one in which we want to please our Lord, our Creator, to please God, if that is the intention, and of course only God is aware of our intentions. God is aware of the apparent and the inner. The bahir, the external, and the batin, the internal, the inner. If that is a good intention, if that is a genuine intention, if that intention is for God, not for self. If the reason why I'm engaging in an act is for God, not for myself. Then there could be many ways of approaching. And this is why the hadith focuses on what? On the intention. It doesn't completely dismiss the action. The Prophet doesn't say that go about your life only based on intentions because this could be misunderstood sometimes in this way, right? When we talk about intentions, some people say, you know what? I, internally, I'm a good person. I have a clean heart. I have a good heart. So it doesn't really matter if I act in a specific way or not. It doesn't matter if I observe, you know, this religious requirement. It doesn't matter if I pray five times a day, for example. No, no, this is a, a misunderstanding of what is being stated here. What is being stated here is that actions are more important, but the ways that the actions are judged by God, the standards are through their intentions. You can go and you can you know, fast every single day and pray ev you know, every single night throughout the entire night, but if your intention behind this act is not for God, it's for yourself, it's for others, then this act becomes what? Worthless. Becomes worthless. On the other hand, sometimes we have the good intention, we have the positive intention to do something good, yet for one reason or another we're not able to accomplish. The ahadith, they tell us that we still receive the rewards of that action. There's a beautiful hadith that says that on the day of judgment there will be some people who they will look at their books of records and they will be completely empty of goodness. 
And there are others who their, their record books will be filled with good things and they will be astonished. They'll look at their records and they'll say, my Lord, I never did this act. I never gave this amount in charity. I never performed this specific thing. How is it? You know, is there a mistake? Has someone else received my record? Have I received someone else? And the answer comes no, because your intention was good. You, you intended to perform this good act, but yet you were, for one reason or another, not able to perform it. So God rewarded you for that action. Even if you were not able to perform the action. Reminding us that the core is the intention. The core is the intention. And thus, this is something that is important for us to remember, brothers and sisters, that as long as the core is good and for God, as long as we maintain that unique core, then there could be, perhaps there may be various ways of arriving at that core. Different ways, different expressions of arriving at that core. And this kind of understanding aids us, brothers and sisters, in the world that we live today, both on a personal level and a societal level. It aids us personally on an individual level when it comes to many of the decisions that we want to make. Right? Oftentimes people ask me questions. They say, you know what, I'm facing you know, issue X. How do I deal with this? And they may expect that I give them a one-size-fits-all answer. This is how you do it. This is the way to fix this specific issue. But that's not necessarily the best way. There could be many ways of approaching this issue. As long as the core is the same, there could be many different ways. So this helps us in our decision making. It helps us. And it also helps us on a societal level by trying to lessen the amount of conflict that we have. When we realize that if you and me, we both have a good intention, we are both working for the sake of God, we are both doing things, journeying towards God, we might do things differently. We might express our religiosity differently. Not everyone has to you know, observe hijab in the same exact way. Not everyone has to observe certain rituals in the same exact way. There could be different ways of arriving at that one truth, arriving at that core. It helps us. It minimizes the amount of conflict. Otherwise, we fall into that trap again of uniformity, expecting uniformity and sameness. If you do not, uh, you know, if you do not participate if you do not express this specific religious ritual in this way, then you're going to hell. Only those who do this way will go to heaven. This could be problematic. It could be. Again, we have to make a distinction. I hope I'm not misunderstood. We make a distinction between those acts that are considered core in our tradition. If God tells me that it is an obligation for you to pray five times a day, it doesn't matter if you have a good intention. If you're not praying five times a day, there's a problem with that specific act. It's not about, oh no, I can just pray once a day. Say it said, as long as you know, God, you know, God is good, as long as you have a good intention and it's for God, even if you pray once, once a day, not for, no, 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 no. Besides those things that are clear, those religious practices and obligations that are clear, are clearly stated, Many of the things that we do fall outside those parameters. And so it's important for us to remember that when we have such a mindset, we understand it helps us to minimize conflict. And again, this is why I gave the example of these luminaries, of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, of Imam Zain al-Abideen, these individuals whose objective was the same objective. They didn't have a different objective. Their objective was for God, the pleasure of God, for the betterment of society. Yet, they took different approaches. They took different methods and ways in order to arrive at that. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, to bless us on these holy occasions and the rest of the holy occasions of the beautiful month of Sha'ban. We have many 
beautiful occasions coming up. The birth of Ali al-Akbar and the birth of Qasim al-Qasim are also here in the month of Shaban. Two other heroes from the Karbala episode. Of course, the 15th of Shaban is a celebration of the birth of our 12th Imam and Savior, Al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan al-Mahdi, Ajalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa Ali. And so we pray to Allah to make the blessed, the rest of this month blessed for us. And to guide our hearts and minds so that we are inspired by these great luminaries and that we learn from them. I'd like to end, brothers and sisters, by reciting the dua, which is mustahab in the month of Sha'ban. It's a very short dua. It is in praise of the Holy Prophet and the pure progeny, the special salawat of the month of Sha'ban. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. شجرة النبوة وموضع الرسالة ومختلف الملائكة ومعدن العلم وأهل بيت الوحي اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الفلك الجارية في اللجج الغامرة يأمن من ركبها ويغرق من تركها المتقدم لهم مارق والمتأخر عنهم زاهق واللازم لهم لاحق اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الكهف الحصين وغياث المضطر المستكين وملجأ الهاربين وعصمة العصمة المعتصمين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد صلاة كثيرة تكون لهم رضا ولحق محمد وآل محمد أداء وقضاء بحول منك وقوة يا رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الطيبين الأبرار الأخيار الذين أوجبت حقوقهم وفرضت طاعتهم وولايتهم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعمر قلبي بطاعتك ولا تخزني بمعصيتك وارزقني مواساة من قترت عليه من رزقك بما وسعت علي من فضلك ونشرت علي من عدلك وأحييتني تحت ظلك وهذا شهر نبيك سيدي رسلك شعبان الذي حففته منك بالرحمة والرضوان الذي كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم يدأب في صيامه وقيامه في لياليه وأيامه بخوعا لك في إكرامه وإعظامه إلى محل حمامه اللهم فاعنا على الاستنان بسنته فيه ونيل الشفاعة لدي اللهم واجعله لي شفيعا مشفعا وطريقا إليك مهيعا واجعلني له متبعا حتى ألقاك يوم القيامة عني راضيا وعن ذنوبي غاضيا قد أوجبت لي منك الرحمة والرضوان وأنزلتني دار القرار ومحل الأخيار برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الفاتحة